Today I will be talking about FTGH and more specifically how to get the fiber bandwidth enabled by FTGH to any location in the home. Uh, my name is Steinko Peters, Product Line Manager at Genexus, a Dutch company providing uh, FTGH home gateways and in-home solutions. So, always nice to start with a little bit of an open door here um, this early morning. Um, why are we going for fiber again? Uh, many companies, operators are choosing for FTGH. Uh, of course, it's because of the high bandwidth. Um, it's about the symmetrical bandwidth. Um, of course, quality of experience and therefore uh, a lower operational cost of the network. Uh, and because you, once you put in the fiber into the ground, you only have to do it once. So it's a future-proof um, technology. Now, as I said, more and more operators are actually choosing for FTGH and also offering it to the end users. Uh, this is just an, uh, an, an overview of some of the packages that are being offered by some of the operators around Europe. And what is funny here is that you can actually see that, that how they offer it is actually not so much different compared to, for example, the traditional VDSL or cable subscriptions, which is actually strange because the, the benefits that Fiber offer of the bandwidth and, and, and et cetera and the symmetrical speeds actually enable a different way of selling it. Uh, more about that later. Um, but what you can see is that they're still very much focused on selling triple play packages. And our opinion here is that actually the end of uh, the era of triple play is basically over. What you see here is just, just an example of all the different services that are nowadays being used and offered by the end user, either by uh, uh, over-the-top services, for example. So we like to talk about infinite play instead of uh, triple play or quadruple play or whatever you hear nowadays in the market. So uh, remember that term, infinite, pl infinite play it is. Um, and it also means that when you bring the fiber to the home, it is not only bringing fiber to one location, it's actually bringing the fiber bandwidth to all, uh, all applications anywhere in the home, no matter of its location. So that also brings to a couple of consumer needs and requirements, of course, because this is very much driven by the consumer. Um, they require this 100% reliable connection in the home um, and anywhere. Uh, and they also requested gigabit speed. And I say quote, quote here because it's, of course, about sufficient speed. It's not always that pure gigabit or that 100 megabits. It's about sufficient and enough speed. They don't want to lay additional wires either. So it has to be zero touch, uh, very easy to install. Um, and, of course, the operator needs to uh, control and, and guarantee their quality of service on this. And, of course, uh, value for money is very important. It's all cost is always still an, uh, a very important aspect here. Now, these demands from the, from the end user side bring, of course, a lot, a lot of challenges for the operator themselves. Um, they have to face with a rapid amount of growing devices in the home. Uh, tablets, laptops, phones, uh, Internet of Things, you name it. Um, but on the other hand, they also face with unpredictable wireless performance, for example. So they don't have real control on their own quality of service in the home. Um, that brings us to the third topic. They have limited control of what's happening in the home. So they have control on, for example, the home gateway or the network demarcation point, but they don't know exactly what is, ex what is going on at, at, at the specific locations in the home where end users want to enjoy their services. So how to actually address the quality of service. Well, just to explain a little bit, this is typically how uh, the fiber enters the home. So you can already see that's quite a different amount of locations. Uh, for example, the middle one is the Netherlands. It often enters somewhere in the metering cabinet. Well, this is not a location where you want to enjoy your television services. I can guarantee you that. Um, same for the basement. And if you're lucky, it enters somewhere in your living room or your kitchen or whatever, somewhere closer to your services. But at, at any point, this is not the location where end users want to uh, use all their services. So that brings us to a bandwidth divide here uh, in the in-home spectrum. On the other hand, we have on one hand we have the operator who actually brings the fiber bandwidth to a certain location of the home and demarcates it there. And on the other hand, we have the end user who expects the bandwidth uh, at the given location they want. So how to bridge this gap? That's the question. Well, there's a missing link in between the fiber and the application, and that is a scalable connectivity layer here. So a layer that provides a secure and scalable way of, of connecting the fiber bandwidth and the application. And that is what I'm going to talk about a little bit more here. 
And the demands for this, so just to show you the building blocks here of this in-home network, you have the fiber termination and the network access. That, is, that part is pretty much covered with an ONT, uh, fiber termination, GPON, point-to-point, uh, -point, for example. But then from the ONT to the actual service, that is the part that we're talking about here. So again, those end-user services or end-user demands that are very important for this specific uh, building block. Now, to actually bridge this gap, there's an abundance of technical solutions out there. We all know them. Wi-Fi, uh, power line communication, the traditional CAT5, six cables, uh, um, Mocha, HPNA, um, uh, I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more, uh, and even plastic optical fiber, which is also now more and more uh, seen and, uh, in trials here and there in Europe. Um, and you can also map them again on the different demands and requirements that the end user is demanding. But fa let's face it, uh, from end user perspective, Wi-Fi is the key connectivity infrastructure. If, if you're an end user, you don't want to lay additional cables, you just want to grab your laptop or your, or your, your, your iPad um, and, and connect to the network. Even s most of the devices nowadays, especially the, the mobile ones, they, they only support Wi-Fi or at least wireless communication technologies. So let's dive a little bit, bit more into Wi-Fi as a technology here. This is an overview of the Wi-Fi evolution over the, over, uh, the past few years and the coming years. So starting at, uh, at 11N in the bottom, uh, more or less introduced and, and uh, in, in 2009, I think it was 2007 actually that it was officially introduced, but 2009 was really on the market. Um, that is more or less the, uh, the standard for, for each device now on the market. Most of the end user devices, most of the routers support 11N. Um, theoretical speeds promised um, around 600 megabits. Uh, and you see that line growing, 11AC uh, introduced two years ago and Wave 2 introduced this year. Tremendous amount of speeds being promised for Wi-Fi. Uh, theoretical speed, so 3,000 megabits, 6 gigabits, and with 11AX uh, coming in the next few years, it goes through the roof. So, well, that looks very promising, right? With these kind of speeds, we can cover everything we want to connect in the home. Um, well, uh, I'm, I don't know about you guys, but I like to watch uh, an episode of Mythbusters every now and then. Uh, so let's also bust, uh, bust uh, the, the Wi-Fi myth here. Um, and starting with 11N, as I said, that's the most uh, common speed in the market nowadays. Um, Promised 600 megabits, but if you're going to break down that 600 megabits, you'll actually see that, that the, the typical speed of a Wi-Fi connection is much less than that. And I'll show you why. For example, if you already break it down into the different antennas that 11, 11M provides, so maximum four in this case, you end up with maximum 150 megabits per second per antenna. You have some overhead for processing, encapsulation, etc., cetera, uh, inspection of the packets that will end, end you up at 100 megabits. Um, then you have the difference of, of 20 megahertz and 40 megahertz channels, which actually means that uh, if, if for the typical router is at, at 20, the channels are much more crowded, which will also show that, that you uh, lose a lot of uh, potential bandwidth here. Um, and then thinking that most of the end user devices only support 2x2 two uh, 11N, you end up with only uh, a total of 80 megabits bits per second for one device or 40 up and 40 down um, for one device. So you see how that breaks down from 600 of nice marketing uh, language to only 40 or 80 for actual typical speed of Wi-Fi. So the story is not so nice as, as it's being marketed by most of the suppliers out there. If you go to the media market nowadays, you even see 11 AC routers, 11 AC 3200, for example. And then the end user thinks, wow, 3.2 gigabit uh, per second speed. Well, it's not like that. And operators have to face that because if an end user does a speed test, for example, you by, by, by no chance get the, get, gets those speed out of its uh, router. Of course, let me get it. some water here. Um, of course, with 11AC introduced, there are a couple of technology ad advancements uh, um, on, for example, how the Wi-Fi signal is being, uh, being sent out. Um, more or less, the breakdown of that i just shown is also still valid for 11AC and next technologies. But for example, um, with 11AC, beamforming is being introduced uh, f to get the signal, signal more uh, directly to, uh, to the devices. In 11N, you still have the omnidirectional 
uh, way of sending it out, um, which means it goes in all directions. Um, you lose quite a lot of signal. Um, and with 11AC beam forming, which means that you can much more directly focus your stream uh, towards uh, a, a specific device, meaning that the device is able to benefit from higher bandwidth uh, from the Wi-Fi signal. Now, with the next generation of 11AC, this is combined with multi-user MIMO, which means you can actually have multiple streams at the same time using beam forming, so you can have multiple devices uh, benefiting from that technology at the same time. That also shows here in this graph, showing the theoretical throughput versus the range. And the range is uh, this time we, we made it in, in rooms and not meters or whatever, so that makes it a little bit more tangible. You see, if you're basically um, in the same room and, and those, those high speeds basically mean you have to be on top of your router, so sitting on top, nobody does that, I assume. Um, but it shows that, that you gain a, a high, high advantage compared to 11 and So the top three lines, uh, are 11 AC, the bottom three are 11 uh, N. And you see, even if you go to the next floor or the rest of the house, the, the, the actual performance of an 11 AC drops drastically, but you still have a lot of benefit uh, compared to 11 N. So there are quite some technical advancements there. Just to summarize the 11 N versus 11 AC overview, I won't go through all the details, but on the bottom side, you see the typical speed actually going all multiplying by four uh, over the coming uh, over the few uh, technologies from 11N to Wave 2 11AC, showing uh, that there's quite some uh, advancements. It's still not the gigabit that that somebody some people expect, but it's it's much more better than than we uh, are used to. Now. Next to the wireless, there's of course also uh, quite a, a lot of wired technologies you can choose from uh, to connect different devices. Um, just a quick overview here of, of some examples. Um, you have the CAT, CAT6 cabling, for example, that, that gives you that gigabit symmetric. It's actually one of the few technologies that really gives you uh, the, the, the full um, uh, advantage or the, the actually the, the, the proof that, that you will have that gigabit uh, connectivity. You connect the line and that's it. Um, with PLC, that promise is also there, um, up to a gigabit, but um, we experience also, and the market also, that PLC by far never reaches that, that, uh, that promise due to all kinds of factors. You have uh, interference signals from, for example, your microwave. Uh, it really depends on the quality of your power line cables in the home or the distance you have to cover. Uh, it even matters if you have grounding wires or if you have, for example, different groups in your home. So it really matters per house, per, per case, on what kind of performance you get out of your PLC. So it's very, very far away from getting reliable bandwidth. Um, Mocha and HPNA are, are typical speeds uh, or, or protocols based on, uh, for example, the traditional coax line or the telephone lines. They are not so widely used as, as an in-home uh, protocol or infrastructure. And as I said, plus plastic optical fiber is, uh, is upcoming. Um, so we see some, some case studies now, for example, in the Netherlands using plastic optical fiber. Um, with this also, you, you get a full uh, symmetrical gigabit through your home. The big disadvantage of, of plastic optical fiber is that none of your end user devices has, an, has a POF interface. Um, so you always need uh, additional converters at each point of the line to actually uh, transmit the signal, which is an increase in your capex. To summarize uh, all the different building blocks, you already see that no matter which technology you choose, you are never able to cover all the different end user demands uh, with one single technology. So um, that means uh, you need a smart combination of exi existing uh, in-home in infrastructure technologies to actually cover um, the bridge between the network access and the application connectivity. For example, um, you can use 11N or 11AC wireless combined with, uh, with PLC or POF or the CAT6 cabling to actually cover this. Um, and this combination is actually quite important because also if you see again in this picture, um, the number of connected devices in the home is, is still going to explode the coming years as well and it's not only limited to one typical uh, device, so it's a, a large combination of specific devices um, that all require uh, different technologies to connect with. 
So you need also that co this combination of technologies in the home to be able to support this. Now, just to summarize in between here, where does this put us? We know that fiber bandwidth actually uh, provides the ultimate bandwidth to the home. That's, that's no, no news here. Um, we see that triple play becomes infinite play. Um, the number of connected devices is, is exploding. We, we see that. Um, and of course, uh, like, we so, like, like I explained, there is a layer of connectivity needed between the fiber in the home and the actual application. And that requires a smart a combination of infrastructures to actually um, bridge that gap. Now, what does this mean for telecoms? What does this mean for the operator? Where are the chances actually um, to, to address this, this topic? Um, well, we see that, uh, and, and our, our customers also see that, the triple play revenues, the traditional triple play revenues, are declining a lot. There's a lot of focus on cost. Um, uh, and, and that means that the classic telecoms business of selling total packages is actually um, a little bit old-fashioned, so to say, and you can say it needs to be replaced or at least it needs an upgrade. So talking about infinite play versus the operator, what could be business models to actually um, address this? Um, well, what are the options here? Um, going a bit uh, back in time, uh, in the time when bandwidth was still very scarce, and you had triple play, there was typical, you typically paid per megabit. So you still see this, for example, in, in, the, in the mobile broadband packages where you, where you still pay for megabits or gigabits. That's very typical nowadays, but for the in-home bandwidth, uh, that's not very common anymore. When you combine it with gigabit bandwidth, that's more typical how it is nowadays. You pay for a total package, say triple play or quad play, so you, you, you get your television package with a number of HD channels. Um, and telephony uh, and, and a specific broadband subscription, for example, uh, 100 megabits. Um, in the infinite play era, era, combined with bandwidth scarcity, that's for example the case in rural areas where you don't have a very good broadband connection, people are actually paying for limitation. And that's, uh, that's of course what no end user wants. With combining the gigabit bandwidth and infinite play together, what is actually then what people want to pay for? Is it for megabits? Is it for packages? Is it for limitation? Um, well, it's a bit of a vague statement here, but it's they want to pay for real value. They want to pay for tangible stuff, the stuff that really uh, sh shows them new possibilities and, and, and enables new services for them. So as an operator or service provider, how can you actually add this value? Well, looking at the traditional domain as, a, as, the, as the operator, um, like I already explained, that's typically where the fiber enters the home. Um, they usually provide a specific gateway there and a network demarcation point, and that is a digital doorway to the home. And then, on the other hand, they, they are very strong in the television domain, so that's where they provide their services. But as you can see, the home is much more than just that. Um, but as an operator, you have to um, sometimes understand or, or be aware that you have a very, very um, critical position in the home. Um, and you also have that trusted position. So people already trust you with a, with a broadband subscription. You already have that critical and value position as a digital doorway to the home. So you can actually benefit, benefit from that by extending your services in the home. So how does ex this expansion could look like in the home? Um, again, this is to the traditional operator domain. Uh, not saying that any operator is working like that, but th that's what you typically see. So they provide the access to the home, and they provide the gateway, and sometimes as an additional service, they also provide wireless uh, connectivity, wireless extension, or set-up boxes, for example. But you can see there are multiple layers that are more interesting also to, to dive into. Um, so could this be the future domain as an operator to actually cover the whole spectrum? So move from the gateway also providing real wired and wireless technology, so high-end stuff that really provides the reliability, um, and go from there and really integrate that into your packages. And making that base uh, with wired and wireless infrastructure, you can start thinking of adding new services, uh, security, safety, ease of use, and really creating the digital home for the end user. And that provides the service and comfort and device and applications that they can use on, on top of that. Well, 
providing that 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 the infrastructure in the home so the transport and connectivity and interaction is actually uh, covered you can start thinking of adding all kinds of different services we already see that some companies are starting to offer home security services as part of their total package um, which is actually good but you can start thinking of a whole different uh, era uh, area of services you can think of data security and antivirus you can st start thinking of offering cloud gaming services which is actually requiring a lot of bandwidth it's one of the main drivers for bandwidth in the home in the coming years being one of the main um, entertainment industries um, that's only being done on a very limited scale at the moment because of this problem because operators cannot guarantee a certain bandwidth um, in-home management and control. Why not offer, as an operator, um, uh, very useful applications, apps on your smartphone or tablet, where the end, how the end user can use their and manage their in-home network, um, IoT and Domotica, and many other services that that are not here, but you can think of yourself to actually start adding when once the infrastructure is done. Um, just to round off the story also, what is our role as Genexus here um, in, this, in this whole area? Well, our vision as a company is actually also to provide the total solution. Um, so not only the fiber gateway or the fiber demarcation point, but also offering the, the total service and the, and the solution in the home. So going from uh, f providing infinite broadband connectivity to everybody. Um, well, just a short overview of our product portfolio here. Uh, which is based on, on four different uh, pillars. We have uh, flexible fiber demarcation solutions, uh, for example, for point-to-point -point and GPON. We have home gateways in all different kinds of flavors uh, with the latest 11AC technologies, all-in-one versus modular versus desktop products. Um, after that, we have defined a range of products which actually extend the connectivity from the gateway to the home, further into the home with Wi-Fi and PLC uh, modules. Um, and on top of that, we provide management systems which enable the operator or the end user to, co to control their smart home. Um, and with that, uh, I would like to round off this presentation. Um, again, from FTTHs to BTTH, it's not only again about ba uh, bringing bandwidth to a certain location in the home, it's about the whole package. And once you do that, you can actually, as an operator, also start increasing your, 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 your mandate and your position in the home as a total. Um, and with that, I would like to say thank you for listening and questions, uh, please ask me. Do you have any questions? <laughs>